as an artist. I also work as an artist. <laughs> I work as a photographer. Um, but uh, the things like um, the question, like why do people work with art, is something that would interest me. Why you shifted to that realm? Um, because the thing is that you know, kind of, when you work as an artist, you kind of don't want to accept the hegemony of the other um, elements, like writing, whatever, like you know, kind of like different different areas that there are. Because you want to do something else, you want to like um, attribute a visual component or a visual layer to something that is like beyond the, let's say, um, yeah, traditional uh, forms of, of, of seeing, writing, whatever. And so how, how, how was this shift for you in a way that this, you know, you were writing a lot and then you said, okay, um, I'm studying in Vienna and I want to do visual arts. What is the difference for you between the writing aspect and the visual art and how does it interconnect, like writing and art? Thank you. Interesting, complicated question. Complex question, yeah. Uh, well, I think there, there were several points for me to start with art. And when I decided to, to become a journalist, I was I don't know, 16 years old, I was quite young. And at that time, I was living in a small city in the north of Russia, where I actually grew up. So there were not so many possibilities. I wanted actually to escape from this place because it was quite a small, gray city, like typical Russian post-Soviet place. And with not so many possibilities. And I was thinking, okay, what can I do? What interests me most? And at that time, I also already was writing something, but more like, I don't know, some poems or stories. And at the same time, also drawing. So these things were always parallel for me at that age, and then I thought, okay, if I do journalism, it's also something like which give me access to the bigger world, where I can connect with many different people to see the different points of view. I can travel, and um, yeah, I can also still be creative in a certain way. But at that time, I was very, very idealistic, so I didn't think about, I don't know, how the typical newspaper works, where is the owner, and where is the view of owner, and the will of the author, how they like, maybe sometimes clash with each other. So, uh, but then, okay, then I started, I started in Moscow journalism, and started to work immediately uh, in news journalism. So it was about, you know, something happening in the city, and then I'm there, or like some elections or some protests that I'm there. So it was very active thing. Uh, yeah. But how did you feel like influenced by what was going on in Russia and the rest of the world? Yeah, yeah. What was like were there like was there like some kind of discrepancy like in terms of like what you were reporting on and what you had to report on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So of course. Like I started actually in a kind of independent news, news agency at the time as I was nineteen. It was my wow. first full time job. And I immediately uh, I was report I was working for I was writing about Moscow Parliament, how mm -hmm. they make laws, like what kind of laws they do, and immediately I faced some obstacles. I saw that a lot of lie, or I wanted to get some numbers about, I don't know, something, or how much does it cost for the city, and it always was not so easy to do. They said, yeah, like it's not clear, we can't provide you these numbers, but then I said, okay, this should be clear, like this information should be accessible for everyone. So, and of course, at, this, at that time I was super young, and they said, okay, you're a girl, like, what do you want? So it was also this kind of not feminist at all attitude to me, which also was a big, a big thing, and I always felt the pressure, so I can't do what I want, I always have to find some ways to, to get the information I want, so it was not so easy. And uh, yes, and okay, after, after some yes, and then also on the contrary, after some yes, I worked for BBC in Russia, and I was very fascinated how they get the information, how professionally they are, how they try to show, I don't know, both sides, like uh, pros and contras, which in Russian media it was not always the case, unfortunately. Always like predominantly one position. And I thought, okay, maybe it's, it's better, but it still was a lot of struggle inside me. And I remember like in 2014, uh, I already 
already kind of this up now. Yeah, I decided already that I want to shift uh, in art because I always was interested in it. I was doing it not professionally, but just for myself. And then I thought um, that I want to get some... Okay, news is something, and text and news, something exists five minutes. Then everyone forgets about it. If it's not alone, alone or investigative journalism, a story. But still, it's not something which lasts long. It's also not something that answers the question very really deeply. And I thought that art has uh, other ways to answer these deep questions about life in general. I don't know, how we think, what is memory, why we care about this and not about that, like something more complex. And I always was curious about that. And I thought that art can give me these tools which I don't have any, don't have any genres. And in 2014, I again was working in a news agency, but in a bigger one, and then this Ukrainian crisis happened. And I already felt like, okay, before we are pussy right, and already mm -hmm. for me it was too much, and I was thinking, oh my God, it's crazy things happening. And Ukraine was just the top, uh, like a cherry on the top somehow. And then also, I remember that night when the, uh, the airplane, MH14, uh, was um, just shoot, and mm -hmm. it was crashed. And I spent just the night in the news agency because we had to do it, and there was, I had inside, uh, the, the very strong feeling that okay, I can I kind of know who could who, who could make it, who, who is behind it, and how much lies around. So I, I felt like I really have to leave this because I can't cope with it myself. I'm too small, and um, yeah, just to continue this. And it's, that, that that that's it. Maybe it's it's more about my personal things. <coughs> uh, so and I answered about uh, the question how the. How, why art? Because yes, I think still it can give you okay text, something you, you read, and you have only one way to perceive it. It's it's your brain working. But art, it can be you can participate, you can be part of art. Other senses kind of involved in the process. And sometimes maybe you, you get the idea or you get the conclusion about something not only through the thinking. Like intellectual thinking, but also through feeling, and maybe not in that exact moment, but afterwards. This kind of this after effect, which art, visual art has, is very important for me. Yeah, of course, text also has it when you mm -hmm. read books and great novels, and etc. <coughs> etc. Et but journalism is still something different, especially when we live in this era of information and social media, and everything is changing every second. I don't know. Yeah, if I answer. Yeah, I mean, it's the question is like yeah. about journalism, about news, is like about information, yeah. disinformation, yeah. yeah, which is like what we have right now with the American situation. Yeah, the whole disinformation that happens and the question what is true, what is not true, and then um, I think the the question is like it's also about what truth can be. You know, I mean, in terms of journalism, you have a lot of detailed information, yeah. whatever it can be. I mean, of course, if you look at CNN right now, they always like are against Trump and like try to kind of like cover up, but he kind of like misread or kind of misinterpreted or uh, misspelled, whatever. And uh, then there is the question like about art. There's also like a truth in art, like some kind of like universal truth. But the question is, what can that be. It's just like, I mean, in a way, a subjective truth, I think, what you have in art. But at least um, art is something that is more sustainable mm -hmm. in terms of like a long longevity, like a kind of, you know, longer truth than mm -hmm. what journalism has because it's just immediate truth. Mm -hmm. So, what would be your answer to that question that journalism, like, journalism is like immediate truth and art is like a longer truth? If it is a truth at all, but or just a subjective version of reality, so mm -hmm. how, how do you see this discrepancy between the immediate, you know, journalistic kind of news spread out that people hear, read, forget, and art that is something that remains maybe a little bit longer? That's an interesting question, but it's really hard to answer because uh, I think. Journalism kind of has some universality, like these rules, like 5W, how you write the news or something. But art, every artist, I think, creates his or her own idea of truth of what art 
and why yeah, it's why a kind of like subjective reality but yes but something that but some artists might last longer yes might last longer but also depends you know yeah it depends also on materials which is also kind of curious for me at the moment like okay marble it's when you think okay from what you are doing your art if you if you use marble it lasts maybe a thousand last thousand years yeah and if you use plastic it's just Less or it's paper, decaying, paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's decaying. This is also interesting, but I think there are some artists, of course, who are looking for truth. Maybe I don't know if we speak about this art history, historian or art critical terms like conceptual artists. Mm -hmm. I think they are definitely seeking for truth because they also are working with the history of these facts and with memory and mm -hmm. try maybe to uh, recreate it. Yes, and give it a different reading, probably. Yes, so I think it can be both. That's mm -hmm. maybe also the richness of art. Yeah, that, that's yeah. probably one, one topic, like a yeah. different reading of reality that art can do, mm -hmm. and that uh, nobody else can do, but art can. And uh, yeah, maybe like what would be your objective in, in, in your art or artistic practice? And we have several objects mm -hmm. here in this gallery. You're kind of like trying to intervene into the Salon Real. And you also have a virtual gallery here. I mean, mm -hmm. which is like right now, a mixture of like, we have this corona time, it's like everything's virtual. Nobody goes physically to places, but you have both here. You have the virtual gallery that you can also see on the website, and you have the physical objects here. So what was your idea behind this, this virtual and physical um, uh, presence? Virtual physical presence. I think these two two places they kind of connected, but not so much. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I think they exist separately also because if you look at the virtual gallery, it's it's a thing in itself. Somehow, you don't need maybe some extra extra positions to be connected with that. And here, I guess uh, Michaela invited me to, to do this exhibition, so her idea was to make it this salon where we can sit now and speak and discuss things and maybe to feel like kind of in a, a different space, not the typical white cube, but the space with some like, history or with some emotion, more emotional problem mm -hmm. space in a sense. And that art here is not, I wouldn't say, it's, it's not the main thing at, at the moment. So yeah, you have the fireplace, you have the yeah. seats, benches, like, you know. People, kind of. yes. Some kind you don't of, see art in the first place. Maybe. Yes, so yes. You have to look for that. Uh -huh. like maybe, maybe, maybe it's something that is hidden or. Yes, yes. And in virtual space, still, you just go there and you see just art. And also, yeah. But there is one thing which connects them. It's this uh, sweet archive. It's a performance which I started to make a year ago. And it invites people to eat the candies or lollipops. Mm -hmm. in, re in reality, they were lollipops. Uh, so you eat them. I ask people to eat them in a kind of form. And in exchange, to give me a paper of these memories, what they think when they do it. And then I collect them and promise maybe to make a new mm -hmm. art piece. Mm -hmm. so, so you can do it still in, in salon, in reality, and but also virtually. You can write a new message. OK, so it's like yeah. a participatory. Yes. Element that you yes. choose. Yes. Um, but that is also like something that art can do that you engage people. Mm -hmm. But you have news or journalism, you just inform people. It's like a passive kind of for reaction me. for people. You can react directly. And now with art, you're asking people to react directly. So, so you kind of like trigger a certain behavior in people with your artworks. That means that there's like more interaction, more communication than there is when you have just the, the direct news coming up. So is that something that, that you feel like you wanted to like enlarge or um, develop that there's like more interaction between people than just having like news coming up and going to a front that has no response? Somehow yes and no, because I had also other words. Uh, which involve people to take part. Mm -hmm. Like I, uh, before I built a huge uh, sculpture which is called Ciso or Divipa in Deutsch, when mm -hmm. only two people can take part, so you to activate it, it's about balance or disbalance. And 
and now it was like I built some kind of pedestal uh, where people have to go through to get in another space, mm -hmm. like in between two spaces. I, I noticed that Aya, ah, yeah, and also was another one, I noticed that maybe after my journalism experience is something that I easily can do because I know how, how to do it and people react to that. Uh, but or what I also noticed um, when I put objects with which people can communicate, if I don't look at them and if I don't tell them how to do it, they easily destroy something mm -hmm. or become very violent or just use it in some kind of strange way, like with this sweeper, like I remember uh, it, it's actually normally two people use it, but then mm -hmm. I saw like six people at the time use it and it, it could easily break and they could break their neck, but they didn't care somehow. And uh, then I started to ask myself, what do I want to show with this work? Do I want to trigger this violent behavior or not? This is also kind of very easy then if, if it's only either two ways, just to play with it or to destroy it. What can be deeper? Maybe it's something also for me to, to explore more mm -hmm. in this case. And uh, here in this Sermon mm -hmm. you kind of like intervene with different objects, different works. I mean, they're like not kind of like a coherent thing. What, what, like if you look at this play thing, or back there, what, what was your idea behind this intervention here? Because like I said, it's a very um, kind of uh, yeah hetero heterogeneous space. Like you know, there's yeah. different things with the fireplace. It's like not kind of like a, a coherent matter. And, and what were your ideas in placing different works here that might not be related to each other immediately, but kind of like maybe you talk about the individual works that yes, are in yes. this space? Yeah. And what were your ideas behind? Placing them here in this uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. Well, somehow we wanted maybe uh, still to break the space, which looks very, you know, very close at some point. For example, in that room there is this second skin board, mm -hmm. which is made from silicone, and uh, it's it it looks like a reading room, like the shelves with books and the table where you can sit and just enjoy and explore, mm -hmm. explore something. Also this crow, this bird, maybe it was a room of some biologist, we don't know that. <laughs> and also this second skin, I made it from, uh, from silicon. And the idea was um, to, repeat, uh, to repeat the structure of snail skin, first idea was. Mm -hmm. Because snail skin, if you look at it in different lights, it changes color, either it's gray, either it's rose, pink, yeah, or black. So I wanted also to make something which looks similar, uh, but not exactly. But also it kind of reminds me of something um, human or something, not, not human, like, how to say, natural, natural. Mm -hmm. But then it's, it's positioned in a way that it's not, so it's definitely an object, mm -hmm. but you don't know the purpose of it. So I think that that was an idea to break a bit this closeness of the space also there and maybe somehow still you can connect it to something from this biology books or something new species maybe species we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also other works like on the metal, uh, they have to print uh, silk print and needle cut. It's also like uh, the one which is uh, red, it's actually inner uh, inner ear of us. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the inner ear of us is surrounded by the strongest bone in our body uh, because if it wouldn't be the strongest bone, then we could hear everything we speak about. Like, it would be insane. So it's also funny, like, I thought to connect this paper and very light material with the very strong one with metal, like, as a two contradictions, mm -hmm. yeah. And here it's going to continue and also kind of, I like to work with silicon <coughs> recently, like uh, last year, because uh, the material is to resemble something natural, mm -hmm. like anthropomorphic, but still it's this one of this plastic stuff. Well, and it also can keep the light, uh, and can change through the light. Yes, this is also something interesting to play with. 
and this work is also from silicon, but different mm -hmm. types, so it looks like a glass, mm -hmm. but it's actually very fragile, you can break it with, I don't know, with your finger easily. Uh, so this is also like an illusion to be solid and not to be solid, and uh, it looks like, uh, I don't know, something deep blue, something from the sea, and, but the concept behind it was also connected with Crimean story, mm -hmm. and also uh, with how we see things, how many cognitive mistakes we make when we think about ourselves, about surroundings. That's also what fascinated me, that we only have this one objection uh, view as a human being. So we see the world like, like we are, but maybe if we would have a lenses of a, I don't know, uh, of the cat or, I don't know, a rhinoceros, we would see totally different and think differently as well. So this is also something which I think could be, uh, mm -hmm. could, we could achieve through art, yes. I mean, you, you were talking like a little bit about the Ukraine, like, is, do you have a special history or like connection to that? Because like, for us, like, 2014, you know, like, yeah, all yeah. these problems with the Crimean annexation and, and things like that from Russia, like, what, did you have to report on that? No. Because no. you were already here when no, you, no, and no, you I, get to the end. No, I was in 2014, but second part, like, in, in October. Okay, yeah. So, it's already happened, like, yeah, the annexation yeah. already happened, and I was in Moscow. No, I don't have a special connection to Ukraine, but I think it's a very somehow significant event maybe in the contemporary history mm -hmm. in general. Because yeah. okay, we know wars happen in the local wars, and mm -hmm. then in Syria, in Egypt, and all this. Uh, yeah, this actually also, also started in 2011. Yes, this, yes. Like the Syrian war started yeah. in 2011 and the yeah. Egyptian. Yeah, revolution. The revolution was 2011, but on the other hand, it was also, funnily enough, the Fukushima disaster was also mm -hmm. in 2011. So I think 2011 was one of the crisis years. Mm -hmm. After 2018, yeah. <laughs> now we have 2020, the next crisis. Mm -hmm. So um, how how do you consider crisis? I mean, there's like every couple of years, like this major crisis here. You know, mm -hmm. we had it in 2008, in 2011. 2014, now 2020, it's like kind of, how do you deal with that? Yeah. I, I mean, think, because like coming from Belarus to yeah. in Moscow and now in Vienna, and like how do you see these different different cities, different places in terms of crisis? I think crisis never ends. It's constantly the last. <laughs> I feel it like this way. Especially when you <laughs> work in you, when I was working in use crisis every day. Here's mm -hmm. some here. Yes, in the news you have crisis. You yes. report about crisis every day. Yeah, but I would say, yes, of course. Like in Russia, I felt crisis happened much more often than in Europe. Like it, I remember, yeah. like, I moved to 2014, and like until 2020, I had quite. There was not, not, not so many things happening here mm -hmm. in Vienna. Like now this corona thing, it's a big topic. And also maybe 2017, like this right-wing parties brought more um, yeah. votes. Exactly, yes, all over also. Europe, yeah, you have Poland, yes, Hungary, yes. etc. Yeah. Yes, it like also many Pen and all the stuff. Yeah. But still was not so crucial. In Russia, always it was connected with the economy. Like, okay, now the struggle dollar exchange rate, mm -hmm. now oil prices shrinks, now everything is crazy, now we don't have money at all, and then, I don't know, people lose their jobs, it was quite often, like, I mm -hmm. think since 2008, it's never ended, mm -hmm. so I think, but of course it's different, and I think uh, also, in terms of history, uh, people in Russia or Eastern Europe got used to live in crisis, because there was this uh, revolution in 1917 first, mm -hmm. then uh, communists came, yeah. and Stalin repressions, the Second World War, like mm -hmm. my, also like my family, I think, like my ancestors, my grandparents, they were affected by both, by communists and then by Second World War, and then, okay, it was quite, um, okay, not safe, but kind of safe time, mm -hmm. aggression and crucial time, but then, okay, again, the Soviet Union crashed down, people lost jobs, they had to readapt. And now again with Putin they had to wrap it up, but differently. Mm -hmm. So it's never ending story, it's maybe the historic overcome. And here in Europe I think it's of course different maybe because yeah, I think also because of all this social media like we all in use to kind of exist mm -hmm. in this never ending now 
today. And that's why I think crisis is never, never ended. Yeah, I mean, he had, I think, the, yeah, the, the neoliberalist tendencies and capitalist mm -hmm. uh, surplus was maybe in the 90s because then you had the dot com bubble yeah. in 2000 and the crash of the Twin Towers in 2001, and I think that was the beginning of the decline or the decay mm -hmm. of, of financial power. So basically, 2008 was like a little later, but it sort of started yeah. in 2000 with the dot com bubble crisis, all those companies going bankrupt, and then, um, yeah, 2008, the, the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, and now, yeah, the question is like, of course, why is there the need for every company to make more every year than the year before, like, like, mm -hmm. like having a surplus? And of course, like, I mean, in the, in the theory, this course, you have the, the notion of degrowth. Like, why do we always have to grow in terms of budget money? Mm -hmm. If you know right now that it is not possible because you have corona, so there's the question of degrowth. You know, yeah. kind of like, why do we need to make more every year than the year before? And um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on, on that, like coming from Russia and then like being here now in a Western. European or former Western, I mean, there's no Eastern West anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, in, a, in a kind of like an environment that also has to question itself, like why do we have, do we have to grow financially every year, which is definitely not possible anymore. So I think the peak of this whole financial capitalist, neoliberalist system was some time ago and cannot longer be reached. But but we're, in, in but we're still living in, yes. in, in capitalism, you know? yes, but we yes. see clearly now that the peak is over, that we can not really at the moment mm -hmm. reach more than we had before. So um, how do you see this, this, what's your perspective coming mm -hmm. from Russia and like now living in Vienna, you know? uh, do you see a difference or is, has this in any, in any way influenced your view on the world or...? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that in Russia, to my opinion, people still live, live in this wild capitalism. Mm -hmm. People still hungry for things, for goods, for consumption. Mm -hmm. um, like, they buy a lot of, I don't know, gadgets or very expensive things, like iPhones and whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, even you compare it like, here. I was very surprised when I came to Vienna and I found out that students from art academies they prefer to use I don't know the, the phones with just uh, without internet, not mm -hmm. smartphones, but the very mm -hmm. like also like palm tech rejection. Yeah. <laughs> he now uses <laughs> iPhone. Yeah. Yes, but then in, in Moscow everyone wants to have it and mm -hmm. um, this is different. So I would say I personally became more aware of the things in Vienna than mm -hmm. in Moscow. Okay. Yeah. But uh, what I, I was thinking that our behavior and behavior and actions change much, how to say, slower than these new ideas, or mm -hmm. even old ideas you mentioned. They're not so new, but somehow we mm -hmm. got used to live this way. And I mean, not me, really just me and you, but just in general society mm -hmm. got to it. And to change something and to live differently, it takes really long time. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure it will change also. Mm -hmm. But maybe it means other, I don't know, 50, 100 years. We're also very unequal in, in the world. The like countries are very unequal. <clears throat> but then I think, I mean, that's like one thing that I grew up with is mm -hmm. like this whole um, process of, I would say, Americanization. Mm -hmm. I mean, I studied in the US in the 1990s uh, when Bill Clinton was president, and at that time everything seemed to be like going up, 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 like really. Yeah. Getting better, and that was also the time when you know mm -hmm. financial capitalism was going up, and 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 you had this feeling at that time that the world is just getting better and better all the time, you know. And then as of 2000, 2001, you had this break, also of course with the Bush administration, and um, actually what I was going to say is also that I think that the, of course the crucial period to me were the 1990s because you had the end of um, 
communism or socialism, whatever you name it, in 89, and then in 97 thought that now the world is going to get corrected, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I was, I mean, it was also like in the 1990s when I started to travel, and then when you saw that, that, that this kind of, what they call it, Americanization thing happened mainly in the eastern part, parts of Europe, like, you know, like, Czech Republic, a lot of Americans were like going there, and in Russia, all the other places like, I don't know, Bulgaria, you name it. And that this Americanization kind of like went on, I mean, more quickly in the east than in the west of Europe, Europe at that time. Because he said, like, okay, if you're like in the class of pocket, like, that people now still have like an old phone, and I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm trying to not get, you know, overcome by this globalist thinking. And uh, yet, in the 1990s, you thought that everything is gonna get equal, more or less, but it didn't, you know. And now you see that, that this whole idea of financial capitalism, market economy, etc. Did not really work out, but uh, and now of course with this corona pandemic, you can see that we are kind of like getting at the limits of possibilities, and also with uh, major forces in let's say Russia, U.S. at the moment. Um, the question is how to how to proceed. I think nobody has an answer now. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> but it's just it's just an observation. Yeah. You know? That, that for me, the 1990s were the, the decade when everything was supposed to get corrected, better, perfect, leveled. And then as of 2000, we realized that we can't. Yeah. And um, maybe just your view on, let's say, on Russia, you know, how did you see that development of, you know, as of the 90s in terms of this leveling of an, let's say, American standard trying to get settled everywhere and how has it developed or not developed until the present moment mm -hmm. and, and has there been changes or is there any kind of like belief right now that we all know, okay, this was wrong or this was right or, or is it just like, as you said, wild economy, nobody cares? Is there any, any, any thoughts on this kind of development of how the last, you know, two decades have changed the world and all? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very interesting and complex. I think like there are many things which go parallel mm -hmm. and they don't, like in 90s, yes, I think it was really a time of freedom. Yeah, in at that time everyone thought, now, now we're free. Yes. In the 90s we thought, now everything's okay and we'll be okay. But yes. then we realized, Both. Yes, yes, but different freedom because, like, okay, the Soviet Union crashed down. Like, uh, there were, like, for example, like in eighties, even if you ex exchanged rubles for dollars, mm -hmm. you could get a uh, death penalty in Russia really? for that. Yes, wow. and I even once wanted to make uh, like a documentary about people because there was one person who was still in prison mm -hmm. okay then he was released of course but he was living like i don't know 10 years mm -hmm. expecting when it's gonna happen but he didn't do it then in 90s he was released but it was crazy that people got it were some not so many cases but still it was the reality or like for example the um, if you're a gay person if mm -hmm. you're a lesbian mostly men, gay, you in Soviet Union also could, could be imprisoned mm -hmm. and there were some cases or in psychiatric clinic. In the 90s everything was added up, all the stupid mm -hmm. laws were like banned, so we got freedom and people uh, became free and we thought okay now together with this economical growth and <clears throat> the possibility to travel to other actually it's illusion. So this is, uh, this is for me like a surprise but it's happening. Mm -hmm. But how it will be Changed, I have no idea. I think it's, it needs really the restoration of the whole system. And uh, I think in Europe, about that, yes, you have many, you have freedom of life, but still you are limited, maybe, as we, we are all limited, we are all dependent on something. We can't just, I don't know, if I say, you know, I want to be just artist, but I don't know how to, how to survive. 
it's no one give me a guarantee. It doesn't matter where I live. In, in Europe or in Russia, there are some universal things which the world still have to cope with. Yes. Yeah, maybe, and then maybe like one more question before yeah. we open up the yeah. discussion. Yeah. Like what made you move to Vienna? To Vienna? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a good question, but it's, uh, it will be a very romantic answer. Okay, so yeah, let's see. Maybe yeah. I it's very romantic <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, no, we got it, but, but still, like, yeah, then yeah. How, how did you... But, but you, you kind of, like, started to study art in Vienna, not yes. in Moscow. In Moscow I did it, but uh, I wouldn't say it's, um, like, a professional, like, um, art study. Like, I took some courses in academical drawing, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. but because in Russia, um, Art education is very different. Has a very different mm -hmm. system. It's yeah, very, it's, it's in most uh, yes. Eastern countries. You have the yes, techniques that you're exactly. trained in, but not kind of like yeah. conceptual Flo thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now it's happening, but it's mm -hmm. also still not um, accepted on the I would say on the governmental level. Yeah. So how it's yeah. more like a private school or something yeah. like that. So yeah, I was thinking uh, about because I learned uh, because I visited. Vienna and Austria was my first uh, foreign country which I visited mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, like, okay, I visited Belarus and Ukraine, but then mm -hmm. I visited the Western European country when I was 11. It was Austria. Mm -hmm. And at that time I was still lived in northern Russia. And I visited here the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Mm -hmm. And I was really fascinated. I never had been in such a museum. I was fascinated by Voigler and all these paintings. And I thought, oh my god. And, and, and so this is the biggest work I later, ah. in later. I so you saw the Kunsthistorisches Museum yes, before the exactly. Yes, exactly. Yes, okay. yes, that was funny. <laughs> that's yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then I learned a bit of German at school, uh -huh. and then when I was deciding where to study, I thought about either Berlin or Vienna. But mm -hmm. somehow Vienna always felt much cozier for me, mm -hmm. and because I had this memory, I said, okay, it's worth trying mm -hmm. just to. To apply here for the university, okay. so it's very <laughs> it's recent. Yes. Yeah. Great. So, are there any questions from the audience? I think everything is said. <laughs> yeah. Then I just uh, have maybe one more question. But I mean, you started the site-specific art. Paul Patrick and nobody changed not to do with it. Yes. Um, I mean, it's like a totally different field for me, you know, in terms of like changing from this more conceptual approach from Paul than to mm -hmm. doing Goethe. What was your idea behind that or intention or like what, what, what triggered you? What, what's your um, uh, idea also in terms of like how you develop your mm -hmm. own art in that respect? Yeah, that's a good question. I think with Paul Petrich, it was a really great time in the class, and I really appreciate his approach, mm -hmm. and uh, also he invited uh, many uh, very smart and talented assistants who mm -hmm. also helped. Mm -hmm. But when I was there, I still felt like it's a lot of new connection with my previous practice as a journalist, okay. in some way. It's more technical than... Uh, no, it's more, I would say, more intellectual and uh -huh. more idea-based. I was really stuck in that thing that first I have to think uh, what I do, like read it properly and have a already the ready picture in my head and then yeah. I do something. Mm -hmm. that, that was for me and I always felt like it was great but I felt that I noticed that I, I started to change also. Mm -hmm. uh, more to the process based thing. Maybe I do something, maybe I have this shape or just want to, to try this material and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And that's why I thought maybe it would be good for me also to try other approach, which is really like good. Mm -hmm. Focused on material mm -hmm. now, but now, after two years in his class, I'm thinking again, okay. That's a good time maybe to combine these both things. Mm -hmm. Because like before, like, like, it was like more yeah. ephemeral with power, yeah. and now it's more material. Yes. Like from the kind of like, you know, space that you have, and then yeah. coming to something concrete. Exactly, but now for me it's also, if it's too too material, this is like too material, I, mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Okay, so you is. need a, a, a yes. something in between materiality yes. and ephemerality. Yes, and now I'm on the way maybe to combine them and to okay. make a step back mm -hmm. and also to to remember what I have been doing this far. Okay, that's kind of like 
getting to that ephemeral material. Exactly. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.